Good morning, everybody. Uh, so it's my pleasure to start the first bit of science here for uh, the course of this week. So as Anne mentioned, all these slides are available under Creative Commons. Uh, and the condition here is that you give credit to whoever helped make these slides. And here's my bit of credit. So I've uh, benefited from some great teaching materials by my colleague, Ben Langmead. So all of his slides are here uh, at this URL on his lab website. And also uh, from my friend, Aaron Quinlan, whose slides are up on GitHub. Uh, so we're re reusing a bit of material for both of those. So this is the first module of the entire week-long workshop. And the goal of this module is really to give uh, a foundation for what we're going to talk about for the rest of the week. And this is going to be an introduction to how high-throughput sequencing works, so what the sequencing instruments are actually doing, uh, how they generate data, what the data looks like, and some of the caveats and, and uh, challenges of working with these very large data sets. Um, I have around maybe 40, 45 minutes of, of content to talk about. I think we're scheduled here for a full hour. So please ask questions as we go. I like to be interrupted by questions. It, it makes the flow a little bit easier and it makes sure that I know uh, that I'm giving, giving the right information for you guys. So please interrupt. Um, as Anne mentioned, one of the big benefits of CVBW is you get to interact with the instructors who've been working on this for a very long time. I've been in, in bioinformatics and genomics for around 10 years now, um, but I'm only going to be here for the first two days. So if you have any questions about DNA sequencing or um, how these algorithms work really at, at, a, at a low level, level computer science way, please ask me, but, but just get your questions out in the next couple of days. Okay. So we're going to start with a bit of basic biology uh, to motivate why we want to sequence genomes. Many of you uh, know this sort of uh, in, in your heart just because you had background in biology. But the, the central idea here is that we want to understand the information that's encoded in genomes and how that gives rise to different phenotypes, phenotype to being the observable characteristics of individuals. So we've known since, uh, since, since the 20th century that DNA is the storage of information within the cell. That uh, information gets transcribed into various levels of different molecules. Central dogma says that DNA gets transcribed into RNA, which encodes protein sequences uh, that, that uh, get translated into these amino acid sequences that then go and fold and carry out their, their biochemical function. Now, throughout this week, we're going to hear about all these different levels. So in the first two days, we're going to be hearing about DNA. We're going to understand what genomes are and how we sequence genomes. And then when Obi and Malachi come on Wednesday and Thursday, they're going to talk about RNA, how we analyze these actual RNA molecules. And then we'll hear a little bit about proteins um, later on in the week and how we actually link these, these different data sets to, together into, uh, into a unified picture of how cells and how organisms work. So... DNA, this is, this is going to be really the, the focus point for my lecture in the next two days. So everybody's probably familiar with the DNA structure, so it's, it's quite interesting to give this talk at Cold Spring Harbor because Jim, Jim Watson obviously uh, with Francis Crick discovered this structure that we're looking at today. I don't think he's here. I don't know how much he spends his time at Cold Spring Harbor these days, but, uh, but really we're all benefiting from from Jim Watson and Francis Crick's work here. So DNA is a double helical structure, has a sugar phosphate background with, uh, backbone, which gives structure to the molecule. And then the individual rungs here on the DNA ladder, if you'd like, are made up of the four nucleotides, A, C, G, and T. And they're linked together, linking these two uh, complementary strands. Now, genomes are quite large. These are incredibly large biomolecules. Uh, the smallest genomes that we work with, viral genomes, are maybe around 10 to 20,000 bases. Bacterial genomes are on the order of megabases, millions of bases. But the human genome and the, the, the very large genomes that we work with uh, are around 3 gigabases. Uh, this is an incredible amount of information. It's an incredibly long molecule. And the human genome is actually packed into the cell by wrapping around uh, nucleosomes made up of hit stones, and they get compacted into these fibers that are then wound together uh, and packed into the divisible chromosomes that you see if you look down a microscope uh, during metaphase. But we're really interested now in just what the sequence of these genomes are. What are the order of these four nucleotides, A, C, G, and T? 
and what do they tell us about how that cell functions. Uh, so we're going to be trying to figure out the sequence of individual genomes. And why we want to do that is because uh, variation within the genome is what gives rise to variation within phenotypes. Okay, so uh, phenotype can be something like hair color or eye color, or it can be more, more complex traits like your height or your predisposition to getting certain diseases like cancer. Now, we sequenced the human genome as, uh, as a field about 15 years ago. And again, being a Cold Spring Harbor, that sort of brings the history into it. Because if you go to the bar at Cold Spring Harbor, I think the reception is tonight, there's a guitar signed by all the people who are involved in sequencing the human genomes. Have a look at that later for a bit of history. But since we sequenced that human genome and finished it, uh, there's been this explosion of data where we wanted to sequence more and more people such that we can understand all of the diversity within the human population and figure out how the differences between individual genomes give rise to these observable characteristics of the phenotypes. So one of the types of variation we're going to hear about are single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms, poly polymorphisms. Matthew is going to talk about this. Uh, I think later on this afternoon. These are just single bases that differ between two genomes. So if you compare two, the, the two genome sequences, they're going to be identical over very long stretches, broken up by these places where there's just a single nucleotide that's different between the two individuals. And if those, uh, if those differences are an important region, like they change the coding sequence of a gene, or they're in some sort of regulatory region that changes how much a gene is expressed, or whether it's expressed in a certain cell type, that might then go on to change these observable characteristics uh, through this, this messenger RNA. So that's really why we want to sequence genomes. There's larger uh, types of variation as well, like structural variation, where there's uh, big rearrangement changes between genomes. Again, we're going to hear about that uh, in the first two days. But first, what I really want to talk about now is how we sequence genomes uh, and how the sequencing technology has changed in really over the last 10 years to allow us to sequence human genomes at very large scales where we can sequence now uh, 10 to 20,000 human genomes uh, in a single research institute per year. And to talk about C uh, DNA sequencing, uh, let's go back to the structure of DNA. Uh, so DNA is a directional molecule. We have uh, what we call a five prime end of DNA and a three prime end of DNA. Uh, so the five prime end is denoted by uh, a phosphate here, and the three prime end is noted by uh, this hydroxyl here attached to this sugar. Now, this uh, alternating links of phosphates and these sugars, which are deoxyribose, give us this backbone of DNA, which allows it to have this helical structure. And then in the interior here, we have the actual nucleotides, uh, A, T, uh, C, and G. And they're complementary, so A binds to T, uh, G binds to C, and vice versa. So these are on the interior structure of the DNA, DNA and they're linked along this backbone here. Uh, now we're going to color the nucleotides here just to identify them. Uh, green is A, purple is T, red is uh, C, and uh, this blue is G. Uh, now, the first technology for sequencing was developed by uh, an English biochemist named, named Fred Sanger. So Fred Sanger is notable uh, for actually having won two Nobel Prizes. He invented protein sequencing in the 1960s, followed it up later by inventing DNA sequencing. Uh, we're going to talk about DNA sequencing here uh, and go into the details of how this method works. Now, appropriately, it's called Sanger sequencing after the inventor of it. And the way that it works is that it uses a lot of the uh, machinery that is in the cell that replicates DNA, but it modifies it chemically such that we can figure out what the sequence is. And crucially, it uses uh, an enzyme called DNA polymerase, which copies a strand of DNA using the complementary strand. So if we have our, uh, our template strand here, DNA polymerase comes in, and then it will find the complementary base to the next one and then add it into this growing uh, chain by linking up these phosphate and, and, and sugar molecules uh, that make up the individual nucleotides. So it would come in here, it would find the complementary base to T, which is an A, add it here after the C, then it would find the complementary base to the C, which is G, and add it here, synthesizing this complementary strand in five prime to three prime direction. Now, how Sanger sequencing works is that 
when you add your, your nucleotides into your reaction mixture, such that DNA polymerase can find them and add them to this growing strand, uh, Sanger noticed that if you chemically modify the nucleotides to make what are called uh, dideoxynucleotides, where rather than a hydroxyl at this position of this sugar, there's just a hydrogen, that will actually inhibit the uh, elongation of this chain. So what you can do is you can take a mixture of normal nucleotides and you can spike in a low concentration of these chain inhibiting nucleotides, the dideoxynucleotides, and if one of those chain inhibiting, inhibiting nucleotides gets added in, it will just stop progression of that DNA sequence, okay? So whenever one of those gets added, we stop here at this G, and you can no longer progress. That chain's not going to grow any long, uh, anymore. So what Sanger did is he noticed that if you do four separate reactions, uh, one for each of the dideoxynucleotides, so one reaction for dideoxy A, T, G, and C, then you use standard molecular biology uh, technique called gel electrophoresis to sort those DNA strands by size, you can then read off the sequence by looking at the pattern of these bands here. So we know in this case that the shortest DNA sequence in this collection was in the reaction tube where we used DDC, and we know that the last base of that sequence therefore must be C, because that was in the uh, that, that was in the reaction where we terminated the strands with C. Now if we move to the next shortest, we see that it's in the G row, uh, or so the G column here, and we know that this DNA molecule ended with a G. We know the next two in size order are T, T, and then A, and then T, C, T, T. So essentially by setting up these four reactions, copying DNA, using these, these chain inhibiting, inhibiting nucleotides where we know what the last base they're going to incorporate is and then sorting them by size, we can just read off essentially by eye the sequence of these nucleotides. And that's how Sanger sequencing works. It's brilliant and you know he got a Nobel Prize and it revolutionized pretty much all of molecular biology. Now, while Sanger sequencing was brilliant, it's uh, what we now would think of as a pretty low throughput technique. Um, to do Sanger sequencing, a technician or a graduate student or a postdoc would have to run these four reactions, run these, uh, these gels to separate them by size, and then read off the bands of sequence here. And you might be able to sequence a few hundred bases of DNA, but as we already talked about, the human genome is incredibly large, 3 billion nucleotides in length. Uh, so we want to be able to sequence that entire thing, and you're not going to be able to do that. 500 bases at a time uh, with a single grad student. So over the last, uh, so since Sanger invented DNA sequencing and the 20 years since, there was a lot of movements towards automating this chemistry and uh, making it so that we can do this at very high scale. And this is one of the sequencers uh, that, that was uh, produced to automate this technology. And the key innovation is rather than using four separate reactions, and reading the, the, the bands off like this. Uh, they invented fluorescently labeled nucleotides where if you shine a laser on the nucleotide, it will emit some light. And if you use four different fluorophores, so four different colors, uh, one for each nucleotide, and then separate them in a capillary tube instead of a gel, you can just go along what's called this trace, look at the color of each one of these peaks to figure out what that DNA sequence was. So here's a timeline of how, uh, how, how DNA sequencing progressed. Uh, so Fred Sanger invented this in uh, 1977. And as I said, one hardworking technician or grad student might be able to sequence around 700 uh, bases per day. And if you, you, you divide the size of the human genome by 700, it would take about 120,000 years to sequence the human genome. And obviously that's not a very practical amount of time. You would need quite a lot of grad students to do that. Um, in 1985, the first automated sequencer came out. Uh, this was called the ABI 370. Uh, that could sequence around 5,000 bases per day. So just uh, automating a lot of this chemistry uh, got quite far, but still it would take around 16,000 years to sequence the human genome. Uh, not really practical again. 1995, the ABI uh, 377 came out. This had a lot of improvements, bigger gels, better chemistry and optics, uh, more sensitive fluorophores, these, these uh, 
uh, colored nucleotides and faster data processing. This now went up to 19,000 bases per day, around 4,400 years sequence the human genome. And then finally, the workhorse, the main sequencer that we use to sequence the human genome, the uh, ABI 3700, which multiplexed uh, 96 reactions. You could do 96 uh, sequencing runs at the same time in 96 different capillary tubes. That could sequence uh, 400,000 bases per day, almost half of a megabase, and get the time to sequence human genome down to around 200 years. We then, uh, as a field, got many of these in places like Cold Spring Harbor or the Broad Institute, the Sanger Institute, uh, to sequence the human genome, which took around, I think, around maybe 10 years of data production for a cost of uh, around $3 billion. Okay, the human genome was revolutionary. We, we realized that we drastically overestimated the number of genes that was going to be in the human genome. There's quite a famous contest where people tried to predict how many genes were encoded in the human genome. Um, I think the low estimates were something like 80 to, 80 to 100,000. And then when they sequenced it and they ran their gene finding algorithms on the human genome, uh, it came out to be around 20,000. That number keeps being revised up, but we understood that there's a, there are many fewer genes that expected, and a lot of the complexity in human genomes comes from things like uh, alternative expression, alternative splicing, and, and different isoforms of the same genes. Uh, something we also learned is that while there's a lot of variation in the human genome, um, to really understand the full picture of, of, of how human phenotypes arise, we need to sequence a lot of genomes. And sequencing a genome at $3 billion uh, per genome isn't really practical. So people work really hard on developing new technology that would drive the cost of sequencing down. Um, and in the next bit of this, uh, this lecture, I'm going to talk about some of the technologies that were developed uh, in really the last 10 to 12 years that have driven the cost of sequencing down to a point now where we're sequencing human genomes for around $1,000 per uh, per genome. So the first high throughput sequencer, and one we're not going to talk about in detail, is called the 454 instrument, which was uh, eventually acquired by Roche. Uh, but in 2006, the main sequencer that is nearly ubiquitous in almost all sequencing data that is now generated uh, came out. That's called the Selexa sequencer. It's now called Illumina. Illumina acquired Selexa uh, somewhere around 2009. Uh, the other two that we're going to talk about in some detail are the Pacific Biosciences uh, Sequencer that came out in 2011. And a technology that I work with quite a lot in my lab is uh, a nanopore-based sequencer, which is from Octor Nanopore Technologies. Uh, just for completeness, though, um, the ABI Solid in 2007 was another short read sequencer that offered very high throughput, as was the Complete Genomic Sequencer that came out in 2010 and the ion torrent sequencer uh, also in 2010. We're not going to talk about the 454, the solid complete genomic ion torrent, as being short read sequencers, they essentially got out competed by the Illumina sequencers, and nearly all short read data is now Illumina, so we're going to focus on that one. But we're going to talk about the long read sequencers as they have some unique properties uh, and unique applications that we're going to want to talk about. So key to Illumina sequencing, just like Sanger sequencing, uh, is the use of DNA polymerase to copy uh, a strand of DNA uh, from a template. So here's how it looks again. We've got our single strand of DNA template. We've got free-floating nucleotides in solution. We use DNA polymerase. It finds the complementary nucleotides and synthesizes this complementary strand in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Now, one of the reasons that Sanger sequencing was, was low throughput and you could kind of max out after 20 years of development at a half a megabase throughput per day is that you're really, you're, you're imaging individual, mol, uh, individual reactions in, say, a cap capillary tube. Now, what Illumina did, or what Selexa did, it was uh, uh, the founders of Selexa, is that rather than using capillary tubes to separate them by size, uh, they developed what they call cycle-by-cycle -cycle chemistry, where they're going to image a huge array of, uh, mul of sequencing reactions that are all happening simultaneously, a single base at a time. Now, the way that this works is you take your DNA sample, which includes many copies of the genome, you chop this DNA sample up into single-stranded fragments, and these fragments are typically in the range of, say, three to 400 base pairs. 
Uh, you then attach these templates to the surface of what we call a flow cell, which is essentially a microscope slide. Uh, you attach them by using um, uh, linker molecules that are, that are uh, bound to, to the surface of the microscope slide, and then the templates come in and bind to these linker molecules. We then perform uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which is a way of amplifying DNA to take those molecules that are bound onto the slide and create what we call clusters of those molecules. So here we're going to have an example where we're going to sequence two DNA fragments, uh, this one here, this one here. So after the, first, after the second step where we attach these DNA molecules to, the, to our flow cell, we then run PCR in place, which just amplifies that into many copies of that same molecule in this region of the flow cell. So here we've now got, uh, what is that, six copies of this one, six copies of this one. This is just to enhance the signal that we're going to uh, eventually observe from the sequencer. Now just like Sanger sequencing, we're going to use color-labeled nucleotides. These are fluorescently labeled nucleotides that will emit light uh, when you shine a laser on them. We're going to have one color per base. And what happens is that it, the first cycle of sequencing, we flow these uh, colored nucleotides, we add them to the flow cell, we add DNA polymerase, and just like Sanger sequencing, it's going to find the nucleotide that's complementary to this red base, uh, which is green here, that's A, and it's going to find the nucleotide that's complementary to this blue base, which is this uh, yellow one, which is G. We're then going to shine a laser on them, they're going to emit light, and that's going to be captured by a camera that's observing uh, this microscope slide uh, from above. And this is a very expensive digital camera looking down a microscope, but it's able to take this very large uh, image of all of these reactions that are happening uh, on the flow cell. Now the difference with the Sanger sequencing chemistry is that this, inhibit, uh, this inhibiting group is reversible in the Selexa sequencing. So what you can do is then after you've imaged the first base, you add a chemical in there that cleaves off the inhibiting group and then the reaction can proceed to the second base. And each one of these chemistry steps where you add in the nucleotides, you shine a laser on it to emit light, and then cleaving off this inhibiting base is what we refer to as a cycle uh, in Illumina uh, terminology. So after we sequence the, the first cycle, you then repeat the procedure, you add new nucleotides, uh, shine the laser on them, uh, capture the image, then you remove that inhibiting group, move on to the third cycle. So we're reading this uh, sequence base by base with each one of these cycles. And this is what the actual output of the sequencer looks like. So we're imaging these clusters uh, from the top down. They look like circles here. At the first cycle, we observed uh, green for this one, yellow for this one. Second cycle, we observed red and red. Third one, yellow and blue, and so on. Yeah? Make sure that the complementary base you attach to is at the very top of the first and second intro. So, in, in the first cycle, um, so DNA polymerase goes from five prime to three prime. So, the first one you can only you can only add it to that uh, that base, and then when you remove that inhibiting group, you can then add it to the second one. But there is a catch, uh, which I'm not going to go into yet. But in the next slide, I'll, I'll explain the catch. Okay. So when we get these images, we need, to, uh, we need to translate these colored circles into the actual base called sequence. Uh, and the software that does this is what we call a base caller. It just takes these images, does some feature detection to figure out where these clusters are and how the clusters correspond across the different images. We've captured one image per cycle. And then it looks at the color and tries to predict which that, what that base was. Uh, just using the color here. Um, so in this case we had a five base pair read, we had five nucleotides here, we captured five images across the five cycles and we translated that into the complementary sequence TACAC, which is what you actually get from your sequencer. So this would be in a FASTQ file, which we'll talk about, which is what we call the sequencing read, or just the read for short. So in this simple example, it was only five nucleotides in length. Uh, for real sequencing data, usually it's around 100 nucleotides uh, for the Illumina sequencer. Okay, so here's the catch. Um, we have this chemistry operating 
on this, these clusters of molecules, but this chemistry isn't perfect. Uh, these, these enzymes, these chemicals that cleave off this inhibiting group may not cleave off it for some of the molecules in the cluster, or they might, uh, um, when we flow these nucleotides in there, it might not actually have an inhibiting group on it, which means that the molecules in the cluster might get out of sync. So let's say we're on the second cycle for sequencing this cluster. So two of the, uh, the DNA templates in here are on schedule. They're on the second cycle. One of them is lagging behind. It maybe didn't have it, its, its inhibiting group cleaved off. And one of them has jumped ahead. Okay. So in this one, we sequence two bases per this cycle. This one, we sequence one. This one, we sequence zero. Now, this causes uncertainty in the image that we capture. When we take this microscope uh, image after uh, using the laser to make these fluoresce, we see that two of the molecules are red, one is green, and one is yellow. And this gives a mixed signal that the base color needs to try to deconvolve informatically. Um, and usually they're pretty good at doing this, especially near the, the first cycle. So, uh, the chance that these, mol these molecules get out of phase or out of sync increases as the reaction proceeds. There's more chances for them to get out of sync. So what we say is that the signal purity goes down as a function of the cycle level. And that means that sequencing errors for luminic uh, sequencing are more common in the later cycles of your sequencing run. So usually, um, it's a good question, usually the, the way the chemistry is set up is that a single DNA molecule will seed that cluster and then get amplified into, uh, in, into this bundle of say 10,000 molecules. Ideally all of those have identical sequence. Now you can have errors in PCR where the PCR, if, particularly if it happens in a very, very early stage, it can amplify into a cluster with mixed identity. And, and like you said, it would be a mosaic of different molecules there. Uh, then it would look like an impure signal as well, where for some cycles it's mixed, a mixture of red and green, and that can lead to base calling problems as well. Um, but usually that's, that's quite rare. In only some motifs, you get these, these PCR artifacts, and the usual error mode is that they get out of sync like this. Now, the, the sequencer will uh, helpfully try to quantify how certain it is that the base call is correct uh, and reports what we call a quality score, which is a confidence level or it's a probability uh, associated with each, each nucleotide that is the machine's estimate of whether that nucleotide uh, is correct or an error. And later on, when we talk about uh, genome assembly tomorrow, we're going to see a profile of the error rate along the, the sequencing reads, and you'll see the error rate goes up and the quality scores go down as you get towards the end of the read. Um, now, what, why I'm going into the data in, in, in detail like this is that if everything in bioinformatics just worked first time, it would be easy. We wouldn't need courses like this. And a lot of the difficulty in bioinformatics is when something doesn't go right, trying to figure out what happened. Just like when you're in the lab, if your PCR doesn't work, your gel doesn't run, you need to figure out why. Uh, in bioinformatics, when your analysis doesn't work, you need to figure out why. And I feel that, that to figure this out, you need to have an understanding of how the data is generated and all the processes that can go wrong dur uh, during data generation. And uh, when you're looking at, say, IGV plots, genome alignments, and you're trying to figure out if, in, in case if you're looking at cancer genomes, if a mutation is true or not, you'll be looking at sequencing reads, you'll be looking at their quality scores, and having this intuitive understanding of how the data is generated uh, is, is quite important. All right, let's summarize Illumina sequencing. Um, so the advantage of Illumina sequencing is it has by far the best throughput. Uh, I have up on this slide here that a single Illumina run will give you 600 uh, gigabases of data over a, an eight-day run. This slide's a bit out of date now, and, and um, one of the problems with giving these talks is the sequencing technology progresses so fast that I always am updating these, the, this talk. So we're teaching this course again in two months. I'm probably going to have to update these slides uh, in two months just because the sequencing technology uh, will have improved by then. But Illumina technology, let's say for now, it gives you something like 600 gigabases to a terabase of data 
uh, per run for a cost of around ten thousand uh, dollars per run. It has the best accuracy. So this error rate that we just talked about, these base substitutions caused by these mixed signals, happens at a rate of around, let's say, one in two hundred bases. So maybe your uh, a single hundred base pair read has between zero and one errors, which is very, very good. Uh, we're going to talk about some sequencers that aren't as accurate next. And for any of these really high throughput short read sequencers, uh, it had a better read length than the complete genomics and the solid sequencer, which is one of the reasons these combinations is why Illumina uh, came to, to become the dominant player in sequencing technology. Um, also, just the library preparation is fast and very robust. The chemistry for just taking uh, extracted DNA uh, adding all the adapters and, 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 and all the pre-processing you need to do to put the molecules onto the sequencer works very well now and, and, and you have very few run failures. Uh, the disadvantage of Illumina sequencing is that because we're sequencing cycle by cycle, there's this inherent limit to the, le the length of the reads you get. The longest Illumina reads you'll get is around 150 to 200 bases. And while that's good for a lot of work that we're going to hear about, if you're trying to do de novo genome assembly, which is where my big interest is, for large genomes which have a lot of repeats, uh, this read length is really limiting. Um, the dominant repeat in human genomes are uh, the ALU family of retrotransposons. Their length is around 350 bases. That's uh, longer than the read length of an Illumina read. So these repeats will cause you to have uncertainty in your genome assembly. There'll be uh, ambiguity in your assembly graph, and you won't be able to get around uh, these read lengths due to this, uh, sorry, these repeats due to this short read length. All right, so I'm going to talk now about uh, some of the long read sequencers. So the first one that came out is called the Pacific Biosciences Sequencer. It's quite neat technology. It's based on fluorescence and DNA polymerase, uh, like the other technologies that we talked about but it's doing what we call single molecule sequencing. So unlike Illumina, which amplifies uh, these, the, the original template DNA molecules into clusters, the PAC biosequencer is just imaging off of a single molecule at a time. And this allows it to sequence much longer pieces of DNA. So the way the PAC bio works is that DNA polymerase is embedded at the bottom of uh, a well here. And single-stranded DNA can come in here, get captured by DNA polymerase, and then the polymerase will synthesize the complementary strand. And our fluorescently labeled nucleotides are just free-floating in solution, and they're going to diffuse into this well. And uh, the, the microscope that's capturing this, uh, the fluorescent signal is just measuring how much fluorescence there is in this individual well. Now they're going to diffuse in here, and when the complementary base gets captured by polymerase, it takes some time to incorporate that, that uh, nucleotide into this synthesized strand of DNA. So it gets held there for the polymerase, and what we see is this peak where we see a jump in the fluorescence for the color of the nucleotide that's getting incorporated into that, that growing strand. So here's what it looks like, the signal trace over time for two incorporation events. So the intensity is this low background rate from nucleotides are just diffusing in and out of the well. But then when there's a true capture event for an A, we see this jump here. And then for some amount of time, over a few milliseconds, say, we see this long A signal. And then when the, the incorporation is complete, the fluorophore gets cleaved off. And it, it diffuses out of the well, drops back down to the background background intel here, then a T comes in, gets incorporated, we see a jump in the T signal, then gets cleaved off and go like that. Now because this isn't, isn't, this, isn't this blocking cycle by cycle chemistry, it's all happening in real time, we don't have this limit of read length. If you put 10,000 base pair uh, fragments of DNA, the PAC biosequencer will read those 10,000 base pair fragments of DNA. The caveat of this is that the signal isn't as clean as what we're seeing here, and it can be difficult in some cases to say, see whether there's a true incorporation event or uh, a molecule ha or had just diffused into the well and lingered for longer than you expect uh, by chance. So the error rate in the PAC biosequencer is around 10 to 15 percent. Um, and the throughput, when compared to Lumina, is quite a bit lower. Now it's around 5 gigabases uh, per run for the PAC bio. So you get fewer data, it has a higher error rate, but you get much longer reads.
Uh, here's just a view of what the read length looks like. So this is a, a project that we collaborated with Cold Spring Harbor to sequence a breast cancer cell line uh, with Mike Schatz's lab. And this is a histogram of the read lengths um, for this uh, for this breast cancer run, we see that there's quite a lot of sequences that are longer than 10,000 bases and even 20,000 bases with the longest read that we got from this data set around 71 KB. This is much better if you want to resolve repetitive genomes because you don't have this problem of these short ALU repeats or other type of repeats in the human genome uh, confusing your algorithm. Um, so tomorrow I'm going to talk more about assembling uh, data with long reads, and we're going to actually have it uh, in the tutorial section. You'll have a chance of taking back bio data and assembling it using a, a program called Canoe. Um, but just a plug for how much better this is for doing uh, assembly. This is a paper that was published in Genome Research uh, last year of assembling uh, a human genome using PAC bio data, and they show just how much better the assembly is uh, than if you did the same thing with short reads. Uh, but we'll go into that more tomorrow. Okay, the last sequencer we're going to talk about is the nanopore sequencer is interesting in that it's a portable genome sequencer. It's small enough that you can take it really anywhere where you want to, to apply the sequencing rather than bringing your sample to these large genomics facilities that have these large uh, Illumina pack bio instruments uh, set up within them. So uh, I was involved in a project of taking this portable sequencer, this is the nanopore device here, uh, to Africa to perform in-field surveillance of the Ebola outbreak. So probably a lot of you heard about the, uh, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa from 2012 to 2014. Uh, this is a guy who worked on the project, Joseph Bohr. He's running uh, an experiment, a sequencing run here. We took the nanopore sequencer into these field clinics and field hospitals, amplified the virus, and then sequenced it directly in the field to give the epidemiologists who are trying to control the outbreak some view of how the outbreak was spreading uh, in essentially real time. We could get the results back to them in a few days because of the fact that we now, take the sequencer the sequencer directly to where it was needed. It doesn't use fluorescence, it doesn't samples, use DNA polymerase. Uh, um, it's more of a biophysical device uh, rather than a biochemical. And the way that it works is that we have a protein nanopore, which is just a protein with a channel running through the center of it, which is embedded within a membrane, which is shown in black here. Now this channel in the protein nanopore allows car charge carrying ions like calcium ions to pass from one side of the membrane uh, to the other. And this flow of ions is uh, inducing an electric current, and this current is being measured at around four kilohertz or 4,000 samples per second. Now this channel is wide enough that single-stranded DNA can pass from one side of the membrane to the other, and as this single-stranded DNA passes through this constriction in the pore, it partially blocks this flow of current. And the instrument records how much current is flowing, and we see the passage of this DNA molecule as a decrease in current. And the amount of current that is flowing through here depends on the properties of this DNA sequence that's in. Now, something that my lab works on is taking the measurements from this device and then trying to predict what the DNA sequence was just using these current samples. So here's what the data generation uh, process looks like. At some time, T0, we have a sequence in the nanopore, which is GCTAC, and we see a current signal of around 60 picoamps for a duration of about a half of a second. Now what we hope to see is as the DNA sequence moves through the pore by a single base, new sequence comes in, CTACG, and we see a drop in the current depending on the new properties of this DNA. So now the current has dropped around 45 picoamps. And this DNA, DNA continues to slide through the pore. The new sequence in here, TAC, GA, current changes again, and again, and again. So are there constants for each base pair? It's not quite each base pair. Um, so if we go, go back to this schematic, there's the, the depth of this channel is around five bases. And the signal that you see is dependent on what those five bases are, um, which makes life for the informaticians quite a bit more difficult because you're not reading single bases at a time. It's this convolution of bases. And it's, um, it's not really like a linear function where uh, an A adds so much signal. It, it, there's interdependencies between the different nucleotides, uh, which, which makes it quite hard to model. So the way that we model it is that we sequence DNA with known nucleotide sequence, and then we say, okay, when the, the sequence AGG 
TAG passes through the pore, we think this current signal should be drawn from this Gaussian distribution here, which is about 59 picoamps with a standard deviation of about a picoamp and a half. Now, if we build up this profile for all possible six base pair subsequences, which, which you do by sequencing known DNA, you can then reverse this pro process and infer what the sequence was using uh, these current measurements. And right now, we're using probabilistic models called hidden Markov models, and I'm happy to talk to anybody who's interested in the actual uh, nuts and bolts of how we do base call nanopore data uh, to solve this inference problem of going from these raw uh, current samples to a base called sequence and now we're also using newer methods called neural networks which you might have heard about as a, uh, a new framework for doing machine learning that, sh that shows incredible accuracy on things like image processing and speech recognition we're also starting to apply these mo those models to uh, this problem of trying to base call nanopore data. Okay so just like PacBio the nanopore sequencer is, is uh, measuring single molecules which means that there's uh, the signal-to-noise ratio isn't as good as the Illumina sequencer, and that means the accuracy of our reconstruction of these base called sequences is lower. Uh, but for nanopore data, it's been improving over the last few years. Here are three different versions of the nanopore chemistry, um, two versions using what we call the R7 pore, one using the R9 pore, and this is a histogram of accuracy for sequencing uh, the E. coli genome. For the early R7 data, the accuracy was around 80%, 80, 81%, so about 20% error rate, again, which is much higher than Illumina sequencing. But the introduction of this R9 pore, accuracy went to around 90 to 95%, 5 to 10% error rate, depending on your sample, uh, which is a bit better than PacBio, but uh, the PacBio error rate is more uniform, it's more random, where the nanopore error rate is somewhat more biased, where some DNA sequences are much harder to call accuracy because of this, uh, this biophysics of how the, the DNA sequence appears in the pore, rather than the, the packed biochemistry where the errors are due to just the random diffusion uh, of these nucleotides. So here's what a nanopore flow cell looks like. Um, I didn't bring one of the sequencers with me, I probably should have, um, but they're, they're little desktop instruments. It's about the size of a USB stick. Um, so on this part here is the array of actual nanopores. It's 2,048 nanopores, any 500 of which can be sequencing at one time. So you can sequence 500 molecules of uh, DNA simultaneously. In 2015, we were getting around 500 megabases of sequence from the nanopore with a read length around 6 kb. Um, with the latest chemistry, we now get around 5 gigabases of sequence, again with about uh, 90 to 95% uh, accuracy as I mentioned, um, and the read length has increased quite a bit as well. Now we can quite routinely get 10,000 base pair reads from the nanopore, and if you're really careful with your DNA sample preparation, uh, we've gotten up to 500,000 bases off of a single DNA read, uh, almost a half a megabase um, of information in one contiguous molecule, and that's something we're working on uh, quite hard. Now, as I mentioned, nanopore sequencing is quite portable. Uh, here's an extreme example of that. Yeah? So, uh, do you have any uh, or maybe a benefit from having more samples start to feed through the pore once something is exited the pore can another sample come through the pore? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you, as once the pore becomes becomes free, another DNA molecule can come through. There is a lifetime to the pores. Um, they be, can become blocked or the membrane can pop. But yeah, usually you sequence, you know, a few thousand uh, DNA molecules per pore. Okay. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah. So then with those kinds of read lengths, then you could, in theory, just put whole transcripts through. And yeah. you could just sequence entire transcripts at a time. Exactly. Yeah. So that's something that they just came out with. Um, there, there's a kit for doing direct RNA sequencing. So usually, so Obi and Malachi will go into this a bit more on Wednesday. But usually when you sequence RNA, and if you sequence on the Illumina, you're actually sequencing cDNA. You reverse transcribe. Uh, the RNA to, to cDNA, then you sequence the cDNA. With the nanopore, you can actually put the RNA molecule through the pore, um, and, and you get to do that directly. So anything like base modifications of the RNA, you can, in theory, read those. Uh, Is the direction that the RNA goes through? No. It actually it goes through, uh, I believe, 3' to 5'. Prime. DNA goes through 5' prime to 3', prime, but, but RNA goes through 3'. Prime. Uh, the reason is that they... They, you have to attach these tethering molecules to, to attract the DNA to the pore, and with RNA, they attach them to the poly-A tail. 
and the, the error rate are the same? Um, the error rate with, I'm not sure what the error rate with RNA is. I'd imagine it to be the same. Um, probably a little lower to start with because a lot of the, the, the improvement in error rate was uh, building better models of the data. And to do that, you need a lot of training data. So RNA sequencing is just available in the last few months. The models are probably aren't trained as well. But, you know, just from the, the setup of the system, I, 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 it doesn't seem that different to me. So I'd imagine the, the error rate should be similar. But you said that they use the poly A for attaching? Like they yeah. attach more? So for non poly A RNA, this is not going to work right now, right? I don't think so, no. Okay. You'd, have to, you'd have to do like cDNA and then yeah. go back. Right, so this is just an extreme example of, of how portable the, the nanopore sequencer is. NASA's interested in using uh, DNA sequencing for things like uh, diagnosing infectious disease during long-term space missions. So they sent the, the nanopore sequencer up to the International Space Station. This is an astronaut named Kate Rubens uh, who ran the nanopore sequencer um, on the space station showing that you get essentially the same quality of data as you do on Earth. Essentially works the same way. You need to attach it to something using Velcro so it doesn't float away during your sequencing run. But other than that, you know, it, you can do sequencing in space. Okay, um, let's summarize the different sequencing technologies. Uh, so the Illumina 100 to 200 base pair reads, you get a lot of reads up to 600 gigabases per run. You have a very low error rate uh, around maybe uh, a half of a percent to one percent. Packed by an oxygen nanopore, it's single molecule sequencing without amplification. You can sequence incredibly long pieces of DNA. You get between five to ten gigabases per run, but with a higher error rate. Uh, something I didn't mention in detail, and, and, and after listening to uh, what your guys' interests are, I should have, is that the, the pack of and oxygen nanopore can both detect modified bases, so methylated bases, if you put DNA, human DNA in without amplification through the nanopore, you can distinguish, distinguish between cytosine and 5-methylcytosine just based on these current signals and how much current flows through the pore without having to do things like bisulfite treatment. Uh, again, this is another big interest in my lab, and we just published a paper uh, showing how we can do that with, with fairly high accuracy from nanopore sequencing. You can also do that from packed biosequencing as well. Um, and again, just my caveat that, that all these things are improving uh, essentially constantly. So while I say 600 gigabases and 5 to 10 gigabases here, take that with a grain of salt, and then it's probably improved since I gave this, started giving this talk. That's my last slide. Um, do you have any more questions? One in the back. Yeah, so DNA polymerase. So the PAC bio is. Sorry? Yeah, it's measuring fluorescence, um, but this is essentially the duration of how long it takes DNA polymerase to incorporate a T. And if it's methylated, that incorporation time is slightly different. Um, so there's there's certain methylation uh, types that PacBio is quite good at detecting. Other ones it's not as good as, at detecting just because they don't have a really strong signal of how long how much the uh, incorporation increases or decreases, but it's based on this, the duration of this pulse. And then so for the nanopore, how many modified bases do you account for? Like, right now, we're just, in, in our model, we just call 5-methylcytosine, so the one, the predominant human methylation. Um, we know that there's a different signal uh, for adenine methylation and for 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, but we, our, our model and our software that's available only calls 5-MC right now. But we're, we're planning on calling other types of methylation. It's just a matter of getting training data to train our models. And 5-MC is by far the easiest one to generate training data for. Like PCR-free uh, squiggles look a lot dirtier than... Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, so the question just for everybody else is... So this is an idealized view of how the, the nanopore signal looks like. Um, but DNA, natural DNA has damage. Um, there can be thymines that are cross-linked to each other. You can have uh, abasic sites where there's not even a nucleotide to it. And that changes this current, these currents that we observe. So sequencing naturally occurring DNA typically has a higher error rate 
than sequencing amplified DNA, just because the amplification would get rid of all these extra artifacts that are present in the DNA. The downside of that is that it also gets rid of the methylation, which I'm in a cancer research institute, we want to sequence a lot of cancers, we want to look at methylation patterns in cancer, so typically we want to sequence the natural DNA without paying this cost of getting rid of, um, or so while paying this cost of having slightly higher error rates. Is that what speed of the number? Uh, right now it's 450 bases per second. So originally the very first instrument that they, they released commercially, it was 30 bases a second. Um, and then they've progressively moved it up to 70 bases a second, 250 bases a second, and now it's 450 bases per second. I think ultimately they want to go to 1,000 bases per second. Is that just the engineering of four? Or? Yeah, so something I didn't mention um, is that this, so this, this poor complex, so this is what they call the reader protein, and this is the motor protein. And this is actually acting as a brake to stop the DNA from going through too quickly. Uh, if you didn't have this on here and you just allowed it to pass through the pore, or if you had a, um, a solid state nanopore, which isn't bio uh, biological, it would go through at something like 20,000 bases per second, which is far too quickly to actually register any sort of signal changes. So this, this is a DNA helicase, which unwinds the DNA. And it's 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 so slowing it. Yeah. So the electronics can only sample it at I think four thousand uh, samples per second. So if you if the DNA is going through twenty thousand samples per second, obviously you're not getting. Yeah, you're skipping a lot, and that's why I think the limit is a thousand bases. Is that you you, just, you need a couple samples redundant to be able to to actually accurately call the sequence. Yeah. Good question. Um, so the nanopore, the flow cells that I showed here, if you buy one at a time, they're about $900, and you'll get a, uh, around 5 to 10 gigabases of data. Um, if you buy in bulk, if you buy, I think, 48 at a time, they're around $500 per flow cell. Um, so there's, there's some discounts there if you buy a lot of them. Pack Bio, I don't know the exact cost for a sequel. Do you, do you know? Anybody know? Uh, no, from, well, the machine's quite expensive. So one thing, the nanopore, the, the machine, the instrument itself is, is essentially $1,000. So you don't have to put a lot of money up front. For PacBio, the machine is hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know what the reagent cost per run is, though. For the RS2? I think it's around $300 per run, something something in there. And you get, again, like 500, uh, sorry, 5 gigabases per, of data. Maybe not for your reason. Sure, yeah. There's two companies, one which is sort of taken over the market of doing library preparation before Illumina sequencing that allows you to get much longer range information. Uh, and the, the main one now is called 10x Genomics. And what they do is they, they use um, droplets that single DNA molecules can be uh, put into these droplets barcoded such that you know that all of the Illumina reads came from the original same DNA source molecule. And these source molecules can be hundreds of KB in length, and you get much longer range information, because you know all of these Illumina reads came from the same 100 KB peaks. So if you're doing things like genome assembly, where you need long range information, that's quite handy. If you want to phase uh, SNPs, which means determine which parental haplotype the SNPs came from. These 100 kb molecules are quite useful. Um, and also for things like structure variation, which we'll hear about later on as well. The much longer range information um, is useful there. Now these instruments are a preprocessor for, for Illumina data. It's a way of preparing the library in a special way before running it on the Illumina sequencer. Um, and I think, again, the cost is something like $500 to run, to build a 10x library to then go on to your Illumina sequencer. There was another company called Molecula, which I was involved in, uh, that Illumina eventually bought, which did a similar technology where you, you barcode individual fragments of DNA. These fragments were much shorter, around 10,000 bases, and then you'd reassemble them informatically to get the full 10,000 base sequence. Um, that's not used so much anymore, um, and, and the 10x is, is the main long-range linked read.
application.